Welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins. So, Alex, it's good to see you. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about the company that you sold. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I grew up in Ithaca, New York, and started my first company right out of undergrad. It was called Next Big Sound. It was a music data business. Were you in college or did you graduate? It was uh, winter quarter, senior year. Okay. My co-founders and I took an entrepreneurship class. I had an idea that I really wanted to start that I told nobody about for three years okay. and made zero progress on the business. So this is Ithaca. So this is a Cornell. Uh, I grew up in Ithaca and went to Northwestern. Northwestern. Chicago. Okay. We won't tell. Yeah. All right. Cool. Definitely uh, excited to leave Ithaca after 18 years. <laughs> I I understand that. And also like for me, I wanted to get out of state and then Don't be me. off on my own. And then I, I was like, how am I going to afford out of state? And then I'm like, in state it is. That's fantastic. That's great. Exactly. Um, I also did a college program for entrepreneurship. So I'm I'm curious about like how that experience was for you and did it help you with the did it actually help you with the, the launch? We won the best undergraduate pitch competition in fifteen hundred dollars, which was a giant check, which was hilarious. That's awesome. And that was our first reason to open a bank account and do a lot of the basics of like incorporating. We should do giant checks for everything, though, yeah. by the way. Like, I wish I had a giant check for you now. That would be nice. We had it in our office and we used to joke, how long before someone sees a giant check before they make a joke about trying to cash it at the bank? And it was always, you know, within five minutes of seeing a giant check, oh, a natural human impulse to make a joke about trying to cash it. You can't help it. Yeah. And we're only human. <laughs> I had a consulting job I was supposed to start, quit before I started to make do next big sound. We yeah. raised 25K from terrible investors down in Champaign, Illinois for 10% of the company. For 10%? Yes. This is 2008. Okay. During the financial meltdown. Were they first time investors or were they repeat investors? Repeat investors. And they had a program tied to the uh, University of Champaign, Illinois. You would think that if they were tied to the university, they might be a little bit more, more generous. generous. Yeah. yeah. You would think so. No. Yeah. It was really cheap to live in Champaign, Illinois. Yeah. And we moved down there for the summer, built out the first version of the site, launched it, expecting to revolutionize the music industry, and no one gave a damn. Yeah. Um, well, tell me what it was then and what it became. So it started as a way for anyone to create their own fantasy record label and sign the bands they thought were going to become popular to their cool. own label. And you get points based on how many people signed the band after you, and you'd be charted alongside the artist you helped discover. Okay, so there's a little bit of like shared ownership, yeah, like model to this, and that's a big deal now, right? right. Like that's a relatively like resurgent kind of topic. And I just can't help myself. I see the whole world that way. Of like, I'm very curious who are the first people to jump on to buying a new product or going to a new location, yeah, uh, store. And um, can you zoom all the way back and understand, you know, who are the first people to start trends or listen to artists or support those are early adopters? Yeah. yeah. I, I like to think that sometimes we are the early adopters, but then not so much. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm still wearing crew socks. Certain categories. Yeah. <laughs> certain categories. So uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Did you get any big names early on or what was the tipping point? It's tied a little bit to that, right? Like who are some of the early people that you were able to get that would help move the platform forward? So we were never able to really break out beyond linear growth of that first version of Next Big Sound. So yeah. I was uh, living on a couch with friends in Chicago and took a job tour managing a band on a nationwide tour for two months, which was super fun. And I never want to do it ever again. <laughs> That's a phase of life, guys. After that. And that was the, <laughs> that was the time the last part of me that wanted to be a rock star completely died. <laughs> when like we had $5 a day per DMs to buy, you know, milkshakes. And <laughs> you know exactly where you can go to make that $5 stretch. <laughs> right. Um, super unhealthy, but got to see the whole country. It was amazing. And we were about to shut the company down. Okay. Even though we got in the New York Times and had thousands of bands and users, um, we just had no business model whatsoever or way to make any money. And that was the first like slap across the face being like, you can't live in this startup world if you can't make money and yeah. have a real business. So um, we got into Techstars in 2009, moved to Boulder, Colorado. So Techstars was founded in... Boulder. In and that's the main location. So there's tech stars everywhere. There's one in Austin. There's probably one in here in New York. It was only back then at that time. And we said, you know, that idea we applied with, we don't want to do that anymore. They're like, what are you switching to? We're like, we're not quite sure. They're like, that's a huge problem. And so kind of for that first month, we were exploring a bunch of different related ideas yeah. and ultimately just started tracking where artists were already interacting with their fans online. MySpace, Last.fm, I like a bunch of sites that don't exist anymore. Right.
making sales decisions yeah. and start tracking all the data historically so we can zoom back and see what are the key inflection points for Lady Gaga on her rise to fame and how can we help other artists not have to reinvent the wheel every time, but give them automated insights and recommendations to make them reach their fans, grow their business. So you're getting into data congregation yep. um, across multiple platforms. Is Did you have access to their API and were you able to pull the data pretty readily because they were pretty early and they're they're open to that? We didn't have API access because a lot of the companies didn't have offer APIs even then. Yeah, that wasn't a common thing. Screen scraping MySpace was our first data. Oh, suite. wow. And then other sites came on as well. We ultimately signed data license agreements with all the platforms, but it started off just gathering the public data. And we had a quarterly review call with Cooley, our law firm, to say the number of views that a band like Fall Out Boy has on a specific day is a fact and facts aren't copyrightable. It's not like we were taking the music or the lyrics or the artwork or the thumbnail from mm -hmm. their page. We just wanted to know how many at mentions did Justin Bieber have on Twitter on this specific day. Were you able to raise money around this idea? We raised 860K in 2009, led by Foundry Group in Boulder. Yeah. And they were phenomenal lead investors. And we stayed in Boulder specifically to work with Jason Mendelson, who was on our board for the entirety of the next big sound journey. Okay. And, um, you know, we were 22 years old and had raised venture financing and were hiring other folks. The first three people we hired didn't know anyone else in Boulder. So we all lived together in a six bedroom house. How amazing is that when you're 22 years old and you're inviting people in for an interview and you're like, so nice to meet you. Let me convince you about why you should work at my company. Yes. <laughs> Which is obvious. Awesome. And you, yeah. you're able to do it. And like, it, and, and So we couldn't compete for certain talent, but we could very do very well from like recent grads that wanted to join something where the management team had zero experience in anything. There's definitely people that are open to doing this. Six and a half million dollars in 2011, moved the company to New York City and grew the business there for several years. Before. Six and a half million at what valuation? 17 pre. 17 pre. So that's interesting because you have some really big labels, right? And it's interesting because sometimes I see companies that work with big names and have a big influence, but how much are they able to capture in terms of revenue from those big players? It's really interesting to me. Well, the music industry itself is very funny shaped. There were four major labels, yeah. now three. Yeah. That control 86% of the recorded music industry. It's a remarkably very concentrated very topic. Concentrated, yeah. And they have a monopoly on the catalogs of all the artists that everyone in the industry or every consumer wants to hear. Yeah. So if you want Bruno Mars, you have to negotiate with Atlantic and Warner Music Group. So that's why investors traditionally hate the music industry for good reason. It, it's hard. It's hard to negotiate with. The labels. The music industry seems to be divided. Like if you go to the NAM, like the music conference in, in LA, it's very much like the haves and haves nots. And the haves have like full fours and it's very clear. And then there's everyone who's has a stall and they're trying to make it into it, but it's very it's very challenging. It's very hard. But you were able to build a company in the space and sell a company in the space, which is pretty unique. Very fortunate. Yeah. So we were acquired by Pandora in twenty fifteen. You shot the gap. You did the thing. <laughs> did you raise another round of investment or um, was it just off the Series A? Off the Series A. Okay. Where were you able to get in terms of revenue by the time you were you were selling? We did about $3 million in the full year 2014 before we sold. Before you sold. And what was the multiple or the exit price? It's 10x that. It's 10x. Off your revenue? Yes. That's pretty fantastic. Yeah. Most of the time you hear like a multiple off your EBITDA in like the 10x range. To get a 10x multiple on your rev on your revenue is fantastic. Yeah. So we had two offers, one from Pandora and one from Google. What was the reasoning behind it? They were for the same amount at that time, which was apparently the market clearing price for Next Big Sound in 2015. Pandora was a publicly traded music company, ticker symbol P, the only one at the time Spotify had yet to go public. Yeah. And we were their first ever acquisition. And we would get, you know, a front row seat to a super choppy public market, multiple CEOs and the priority was the music industry and music. Google offered a lot of every founder I knew who sold a company to Google was like, they treated us super well. It was like a well-oiled machine to kind of 
chop up and place everyone within the system. Yeah, I can't but imagine. Data analytics for the music industry would be a sub priority within a sub priority. I mean, even right now, they're getting into YouTube music now, right? Like, n- not now, now, but like it, you can see it being a priority today in 2024 yeah. right but you weren't seeing that in 2015 you weren't seeing like you would see google kind of like do a push and then kind of pull back yeah and like something that's really interesting is that have you seen like the google products kind of like uh graveyard yeah it's kind of i love that they recognized right what did google want and what did pandora want what were they missing i mean we had a core expertise in making data useful for the music industry okay and so at that time all of the big players the facebook's google um amazon etc they were all trying to build artist portals to be friendly to help the artists and musicians and yeah to get them on labels, the platform get them on the platform educate them about the role and importance of each of their platforms in right. the industry but if you're a manager or a label or an agent you don't want to log into 15 different dashboards so you need to be able to see how do my iTunes track sales compare against my Facebook page likes my right. Wikipedia page views my dot com visits my ticket sales did you work with attribution with influencers at all or was it mostly like you were just giving them the data and then they were able to attribute it to whatever they were doing on the marketing side? It was mostly tools, a suite of analytical tools they could use to try to understand that with all the daily numbers, all right, we had this blog post or this late night TV appearance. Yeah. And what was the spike associated with it? Right. Nielsen had been providing weekly CD sales information since 1991. Okay. But we were the first to kind of bring all the new data points together and release them daily with manipulable tools that they could use. You were the new version. We were like the next generation. That makes a lot of sense. And then from like, um, from your standpoint, you were, you started the company when you were 22, I yep. want to say. When, how old were you when you sold? 29. 29. Pretty big difference between start and, yeah. and end. So like <laughs> being in a house, you know, and right. moving to New York and, and having a company that you sold at Pandora. What was that like for you from like a lifestyle standpoint? What it was like for me, Personally, I mean, you spend every day thinking about the company and I'd never worked anywhere else. So besides Next Big Sound, a company I'd created. So we had unknowingly recreated a whole bunch of different things that other companies, it was like, you know, when they find a tribe in Brazil that yeah. not had any contact with any civil right that was you guys we were like creating our own versions of everything because I, we'd never worked anywhere I think that's amazing though and there's like some weird things where it's like that's unique to my company like we're the only ones that use this model and then there's the other thing where like you just reinvented the Eisenhower matrix and it's been around the entire time or you just recreated a SWOT analysis it's hard to put your head out it's hard to understand what happens in other companies and it's hard for an entrepreneur especially when they're inside a company for longer than three years, in your case, significantly longer, um, you don't get that exposure. And so I recently started doing some things with some other entrepreneurs that I know where we swap. Like I see their day and they see my day. So I invite them into my meetings to get to see how things are ran and they pick up on like small things. So they're in the sales meeting with me. Cool. They're seeing a CRM and how we're operating in our workflows and they pick up on small. Things. I'd heard some foundry CEOs take it even further and switch like for a week where That's they will like actually trade. Incredible to me. Which is insane. So let's talk about the Pandora transaction. You went over and um, how was it for the team? Like did the, how did the team transition? Did all of them join you? They kept the whole team. They kept okay. the product in market and they treated us super well. I mean, you guys are nine people, well, right? It's like 25 when we were acquired. Oh, okay. So, so you guys went when we moved to New York and then 25 when we were acquired. So all 25 stayed together. How many years were you there? I stayed five years. That's fantastic. Most of the time when I hear about earnouts, yep. it's relatively like um, a short span. There were three of us co-founders. One of us left after two years, one left after three, Okay, and I stayed five. And I'll explain kind of why and what I was doing. Yeah, that would uh, be great. But the Next Big Sound team was treated really well. I basically, once the transaction closed, kind of put my head down and stuck out my hand and waited for the orders to come down. And shockingly, they were like, 
you're a smart team. You tell us now, you know, our plan and strategy Wow, where you think you can be most impactful, which that's fun. not expecting. I had to do a lot of conversations with the team when we would get, you know, flash surveys and other company wide things. And they're yeah. like, do we answer this as next big sound or as Pandora employees? I'm like, we're all Pandora employees. Pandora bought the entire company. They bought the furniture you're sitting on. They bought the IP, the trademarks, every single thing. Yeah. But still there was, you know, a lot of pride and goodwill towards next big sound and the organization Pandora had never bought a company before, but a lot of the, all the senior leaders had been involved in multiple transactions before. Yeah. Um, the CFO had been at Adobe and ancestry.com and the that product definitely. Opener, into it and Amazon who I reported into Chris Phillips, who's amazing. You know, our first task, Pandora had never done direct deals with the music industry. So we were tasked with signing and reporting Pandora data out to the music industry, which is what we've been doing for years to yeah. the labels and publishers and managers. And so we, you know, got to see and be part of this strategy to directly negotiate deals with the labels. Hi there, this is Nate Houghton with the Made It Podcast. Wanted to let you know that this episode is supported by Rush Imhotep. Rush is a financial advisor with Northwestern Mutual. He is one of our preferred advisors that we like to connect people with, specializes in working uh, with individuals with non-traditional career paths like entrepreneurs. If you want to learn more or connect with Rush, you should go to wealthwithrush.com. The link is in the episode bio below. Check it out. Let us know what you think. How different was it negotiating with him as uh, Next Big Sound versus Pandora? Very different. <laughs> you knock uh, on the door and they open up the door. We'd always used our big data partners to Existence. So I really grew up with it. And so on reflection, a lot of the very senior executives that had been at the majors for decades, they would see me almost as like their grandchildren who were native in all of this and must have uh, helped me and not hurt me in signing and negotiating these deals. It is interesting. And, and maybe this is like a topic where maybe we can pull out some themes, but there's some things that I feel like are overrated as far as like you, this um, younger like prodigy or younger tech founder that figured out this new company and was able to make it work. Like that's something that you hear about more, but it's overrepresented. It doesn't happen nearly as often. It's not something that investors are looking for. It's, 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 it's harder, right? But on the other hand, like you're talking about how they viewed you as like their, their grandchildren or something mm -hmm. like that. Like when we were starting a company at the University of Texas, it was like easier to talk to people. It was easier to get in. Like we we're using the university system. We had great mentors and advisors. Like we had Bob Metcalf that did 3Com and wow. Ethernet cable. Yeah. We had Metcalf. Ben Dyer that did uh, yeah, Metcalf Salon. We had Ben Dyer that did Peachtree Software and like a lot of these really cool OG like yeah. founders. And it was leveraging your your age wherever you're at there's definitely something that you can use um there's definitely something that you can use whenever you're using the university system or using your age to target a certain demographic so totally did you have anything from your 20s that you kind of like pulled out for us it was yeah leaning into the um hey we're never going to out compete google or facebook on offers yeah but we can offer them something that they can't which is like incredible autonomy and involvement in a company where they <laughs> CEO and founder is the same age as, you know, yeah. the software engineer who just joined. There's something magical about figuring it out together. Yeah. Kind of and we'd recruit heavily from, you know, universities where we had networks and just kind of leaning into your advantage, whatever those are. I'm 
very feel very strongly that everyone has those advantages and yeah. often just if you're trying to out compete someone on their advantage you're going to lose stay in your like zone of excellence yeah. like your your sweet spot so at pandora i ended up taking on more and different teams i also for the first time in my career started working more of a nine to five schedule that's refreshing i don't know Maybe. if you've ever done that well yeah actually I, I do feel like actually as the company got bigger for me i got more of a regular schedule yeah. so like once the company was at size and at scale for us it, i think it was like north of 40 million and revenue is when we had like a leadership team schedule kind of chilled out a little bit. Yeah. Everyone was in their seat doing what they're supposed to. So we were able to experience some of that. But I also kind of like working late. Like when things are quiet, like that's really nice. <laughs> when people are sleeping, that's when you can get some work done. So you were experiencing more of like a balanced schedule on nine to five. Well, when we moved to New York, I remember we finally started observing one day on the weekends, like me, Samir and David, the co-founders. Nice. And I had to like Google. I was like, what do people in New York do on the weekends? World's your oyster. <laughs> Turns out drinking mostly. Mostly drinking. Yeah. If you actually work between nine and five, you can get a lot done and you also have an enormous, and you don't have kids, an enormous amount of time in the morning and evening. I have two daughters. Okay. Yeah. Four years old. During that time, I, I didn't, and I still had all the same energy that I had before. And like a lot of folks that, are wired the way we are. I just like had to channel it into all sorts of things. Yeah. And so the part I did want to share about, I feel like I got to experience my post exit identity crisis, et cetera, in the safe confines of working at the acquiring company in a role I was very familiar with, head of Next Big Sound at Pandora. Yeah. With a bigger team remit resources behind us, able to achieve, you know, above and beyond what we wanted to with that acquisition, what they wanted to with that acquisition and run a marathon, train to run a marathon, and then try out three different professional identities that I thought I might be into in a parallel universe where Next Big Sound had never existed. What was So that? have you heard about or done any like lifestyle design I've, type I've stuff? heard about this because like secretly, I, I'm not sure if this applies, but like secretly I want to be like, What's it like being a firefighter? What's that, it like being a chef? But you you have like these mental walls up, right? Like you're thinking like, I can't you, do that. You run get crazier walls than that. Yeah. Uh, so you, you pick three professions that yeah. you wanted to do. So were the three. Ryan were investor, because when you're an entrepreneur, that sounds like the best. You always want to be on the other yeah. side of the table. And you're like, why do you get the money? Right. Like Author okay. and professor. Okay. I like the third. That's a goal of mine. So... Right. So I partnered with the um, dean of the music business program at NYU. We can start there since okay. we're interested. Yeah, Larry Miller. And we co-created a class, Data Analytics in the Music Industry. That's a fantastic a class. Grad level course. I hosted the first section of that course at our Next Big Sound offices and gave them tons of data sets and access to programs and helped build that curriculum. That's fantastic. And then I taught that for five years. And it was amazing. So I got to write the curriculum and run it, the whole thing from scratch, the data yeah. sets, the homework assignments. I taught it in the negative teaching framework that I only had one professor do, the entrepreneurship professor, Troy Hanikoff at Northwestern, which is yeah. he would teach, norm, the normal way to teach is call, is um, I'm going to teach you a lesson, lecture about financial models. And then the homework assignment is going to be on financial models and you have to model it and show that you absorbed the lesson okay negative teaching is the inverse of that which is your homework assignment to show up to this class about financial modeling is to build a financial model that you haven't yet learned how to do so you're going to struggle and fail and Make you're going to show up with a hole in your brain ready to receive the information i'm going to give you how to actually do it i like the i like that i think uh, that makes sense so how did you what's an example of this well i would do that with um give them a disastrously messy data set, which is how they all are. Yeah. And then they would have to clean it up and bring in a clean, polished data And come up with some in. insight. And then answering a simple question like, what's um, the most popular holiday song? Well, now you're like, uh, chat GBT, code interpreter, what is the best? Yeah. Right. <laughs> anyway, that class is now required for all grad students at the Steinhardt Music Business Program. That's fantastic. Did you do this while you were at... Pandora. Pandora. So you were able to still have that. So I got a... 
Pandora's permission to teach this class. Yeah. I got to invite the last half of the class was data analytics for every sector of the music business. So okay. data analytics for band managers. And I've had band managers come in and I'd grill them on how they were using data and tools, data analytics for Alex, you were the coolest teacher. Oh, so much. I want to attend this class and I'm not even in the music space. Yeah. It sounds amazing. So that was my favorite of the three careers I tried on. That's the punchline. But That's, I yeah. only have an undergrad degree and I'm not qualified to teach really anything. I think you're more qualified than a lot of people I know, actually. So oh, I, uh, And the adjunct professor economics are not favorable. I yeah. donated all my money to uh, Music Will, which is a great charity that puts musical instruction back in public schools. Big fan of Music Will. Yeah. Um, music Will and, and Give a Note are fantastic. Cool. I was on the New York board for many years too. Yeah. Music Will. Anyway, that was really cool to get kind of, I would have people that we were negotiating with at Pandora from the labels come in and into the class. It was just a very cool. I feel like you made like your own little ecosystem, right? Oh. Like you had this ecosystem of like you have Pandora here and then you have the school environment here and this nonprofit and then you're able to. It was. They all benefit. It was perfect. It. That's really cool. Are you, are you still involved and in, where are you involved in now? So I stopped all of those things and I will tell you I'm starting a new company. And it's a little bit of a pivot. Completely different. Not a little bit of a pivot. <laughs> but I am trying to recreate eventually that ecosystem where yeah. uh, the nonprofit work I do can contribute, the startup work, the like it all fits together because that was a really magical five years. I like the saying that like, why do something for one reason when you can do it for a hundred? Like, I think that's um, that's cool. It's like, yeah. And if one of the reasons don't work out, you have 99 more. Right. Yeah. And so like with this podcast, there's also the entrepreneur cooperative. So the podcast helps with echo and echo helps with founders compared to post exit founders. And then it helps kind of build, hopefully it helps build on itself. Right. Yeah. And then they become pre exit founders become post exit founders. And it's like a little bit of a circle of life. Plus with your buying companies and yeah. the ecosystem you're creating that way and learning. And so, yes, um, you, uh, you're pivoting completely. And you're your professor Alex, and now you are you're going into a new a new venture. Yeah, and my other two identities that I tried on were the investor. So David Samir and I each put aside money from the Pandora acquisition. We called it Next Big Ventures, and we invested mm -hmm. in like fifteen data analytics companies focused outside the music industry. Yeah, and I found that very. I was surprised how unrewarding I found it intellectually. I had a lot different view of what investing would be like did you want to be more involved of course that that checks out yeah yeah and i also thought it would be more thesis driven like how's the future of this space going to unfold and let's find the perfect company and team tackling it just the way we see it yeah it's like the right stuff you're building like the first astronauts and you're like i want the best person yeah. from each category or going to the moon it's going to be great and then it turns out it's much more like Either it's a hot round and it's closing in 24 hours and they can make room for us, but we have to decide quickly, or it's like so early on in our 25K checks, not going to get them anywhere and it's probably just going to evaporate and yeah. move the needle. So I think part of that was, you know, the size checks we were writing and the time 2015 to 2019 we were doing that. Um, but we haven't invested in anything since 2019. You invested in a pool of companies, um, and there's been enough time. Have any of them were any of them able to exit? What did that look like? The first one we ever invested in um, is doing the best, and we had a tender offer to buy our investment out, which would return all the capital we'd invested in all the others. It's funny how that works. So that's right? the like power law model, but it's just like it was a giant pivot that they made, and we loved the team and the original idea <laughs> don't have any kind of helper affiliation for the second version of it so it was just like random and didn't feel like we had that much to do with their ultimate hmm. um, success they're still going and doing great well i mean he helped fund them in the beginning and eventually got them to yeah. the it so that's something <laughs> right it's like the first stage of a rocket you got yeah, there so i'm glad we didn't raise outside capital or other people's money or sign up for a big fund to do that professor investor author author i wrote 55 blog posts and you know and published before i even published the first one and published one a week for a year okay so i was like i don't actually love the sitting down and writing as much as i romantically did in my head 
I have this illusion of myself like going to like a lake house and being I'm like, I'm going to cut out all distractions and I'm going to Hemingway this thing and it's not going to happen. Have you tried doing that? Yes. You're going to go insane. Not, not great Wait, at all. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I want to know about like the name of the book. I wrote more when I was younger and it was more fantasy stuff. A little bit smutty. <laughs> a little bit of steam, a little bit of spice. And it's, it's out there on the internet. It's under a different name. Pseudonym? It's under a pseudonym. Yeah. And I'm not going to share that on the podcast, but it's, it's, uh, it's out there. Yeah. And I definitely did a clean version for my parents. I just like cleaned it up. <laughs> Self-published? Self-published, yeah. So there's like these different blog sites where you post, like you post and then you get feedback from other authors. Yeah. They rate it. And then you kind of go from there. So you were doing a blog post kind of similar to these, like these sites where you get feedback from other authors. You're getting in some ways feedback from other readers, people yeah. on, on your blog post. Okay. I felt like those three were kind of the ones out areas I was most intellectually interested in. Yeah. And I did that in the first two years. I had all of that kind of running and humming. We were making angel investments. We were right. I was writing. You did this in two years and you were working at Pandora. Right. It's pretty tight. Yeah. If I didn't know how the acquisition was going to go. Yeah. And I was like, well, what the hell am I going to do? because I've only known Next Big Sound. And then I got offered a role running the content programming team, the yeah. team at Pandora. That's pretty big. Individual genre editors. So we had one per genre that we make superhuman through tools and technology. So head of hip hop, head of pop, country, Latin, jazz, blues, classical. Okay, come on. That's pretty amazing. It was. I just imagine like all these people are around a table and they're all dressed up like their genre. Like the Western guys there with the No joke. Hat. It's like the Avengers when they're all superheroes in their genre. Yeah. And they pretty much were caricatures and embodiments of the culture and the genre. That's so represent. cool. It was so cool. I want um, to do like a video series, by the way, with that table and like show them like the latest drop from like a Kendrick Lamar. Yeah. Like Drake oh, Mattel. Nice. That would be really cool to see. So we had like. Head of pop was Tiana Lewis, who was just like super opinionated and always nailing, you know, what was going to resonate. J1 was our head of hip hop. Um, Rachel and then Jen were head of country. Marcos was head of Latin. Juan did African programming, Caribbean. Uh, it was awesome. Uh, That's really cool. Just a wonderful team of, of people. And then I took on the algorithmic recommendation personalization team as well. That's a big one. Not doing the next big sound. This is like most of the product. So I became the VP of content and programming at Pandora across yeah. music, comedy, and podcasts. I can see why you stayed so long, right? And it was fascinating. And so it was this awesome intersection of millions of listeners every day, tens of millions, um, all the data points and feedback coming in, our industry relations team that was feeding us, you know, the pre-release tracks and what was coming out and what the labels were prioritizing. Yeah. Um, and just that kind of intersection of culture and podcasts and music and comedy. It was, it was awesome. Hey, podcast listeners. I made Operator Equity as a place for entrepreneurs to invest and buy in other entrepreneur-led businesses. If you guys are interested in uh, learning more and possibly buying a business, or if you're interested in possibly selling your business to other entrepreneurs that have sold their business in the past, please reach out to OperatorEquity.com. I'm really excited about this new project, and I think that entrepreneurs should be buying more businesses. So if this resonates with you, check it out. Bye. Uh, so you stayed for five years. Did you take a break after the five years? I took a year off. A year. What did you do? So I had two kids under two during the pandemic. That requires a lot of activity time. We had two full-time jobs. We were in a two-bedroom apartment. My wife was working in Blackstone. Okay. Very um, intense finance role there. And we moved to her parents in Pennsylvania. Okay. And we were working our jobs and being bad parents and bad employees. And I left in September of 2020 and we moved back to New York City then. Okay. And my, I cheated in my year off from a parenting standpoint. I, our kids were in daycare during the day, nine to five, but I still had hours in the morning and at night. With That's them. like the dream. Though, is was, you have a little bit of a break and you're like, I'm going to watch my show that I've been waiting for and it's going to be my time. Uh, so I gave myself a full year, um, no timeline around when I needed to start thinking on my next thing. Were you antsy or were you okay? I was okay. I think I'd had a nice long honeymoon and maternity and paternity leave. And so okay. I experienced some of those like, oh my God, it's Tuesday at 9 a.m. and everyone I know is working. I get a rash, Alex. 
Well, I'm pretty sure I was like break out in hives. That yeah. moment when <laughs> when your day's empty and it's very quiet. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, so we were talking about post exit founders and some camps, some commonalities. There's people that get antsy and people that don't get antsy. Like the people that don't get antsy, they take time. The people that are antsy, they're on to the next thing like right away. There's a group of post exit founders that are post economic and retired. Like they're done. Yeah. And they're like tapped out. We know some of the emails. And then there's a, there's another one where they're like focusing predominantly on investing. So they're focusing more on their family office, managing the money that they were able to get from their exit. There's an, another camp, which is immediately onto the next thing. I would probably say Venture Studio is kind of in between like launching a new idea and investing. So it's like somewhere in between. But those seem to be the three different camps. And you kind of hit on some of them, right? Like you were doing your earnout and plus some at Pandora. And you were doing, you had your investor hat that you were wearing. And then eventually you were able to, you weren't antsy and you were able to take time to decide what you want to do next. So you were able to hit on some of these different groups. Yeah. It's funny. We all went through this, you know, our own journeys at different timelines and over periods of time and um, with different levels of financial outcome, but the similarities are striking around Mm -hmm. kind of realizing I can't just do nothing because I'm not wired that way. And now who am I sitting with that stillness, asking those hard questions and figuring out how to use your, your precious time. So I, I feel very lucky in that I kind of cheated when I see some of the others, um, folks who have, you know, acquisition and then like termination or they're like their last day is the day the acquisition closes. And that's a very jarring juxtaposition for me. I felt like I had kind of the, a little bit of a cheat code. I had the five year of increasing responsibility within a larger organization at Pandora. Pandora itself was acquired by Sirius XM. So I got to see the, on the other side of that. Yeah. Um, but you're also getting exposure on like how they organize, um, like a bunch of different business practices, working with a wider variety of different people, working with the head of hip hop and head of country and the head of jazz. And so like we, you go from this thing where you're, you're creating your own systems and it's probably very interesting to operate on other playbooks that are not yours. Totally. I was like, what's an HR business partner? I'm like, <laughs> I didn't know any of the, what's a, what's a funding business partner? All these roles. And you're like, oh, that would have been nice if I had this before. RevOps. Yeah. Yeah, um, for sure. I'll- it's night and day different different skill set and different roles yeah and um especially like for example around 20 you're like i need hr like that's usually when that hits and it's like kind of loosely standard across um industries because at 20 people usually get that one person that you're like hmm. i'm wondering if the part of the through line for me is always like why does why do you why do the how can we have the 20 person CEO, founder, he or she not need to discover on their own that they should have a people person starting around then. And Mm. what, you know, with Next Big Sound, it was always, hey, you're not the first indie rock band from Brooklyn or the first up and coming hip hop artist. What have been, what have other artists like you that are a step or two ahead done successfully at this stage in their career? There's some tracks there. And tracks. And when we Uh get into what I'm working on now, the same kind of thing of like, hey, you're not the first manufacturer of this sector or that sector what are other incentives and tax credits that you're taking advantage of that the manufacturer down the street is also utilizing that you don't know about right now we have access to more information than we ever had before and the easier ways to access that information so we're getting into verbal picture video right like so however you like to consume data it's easier to consume that data so there's a little bit of hope right and then i'm a little curious about like a lot of entrepreneurship can't be taught kind of question versus it can be taught and like there's some amazing videos on like how to start a startup that Y Combinator did and a bunch of other like Paul Graham essays, a bunch of quality content that's already out there. And I'm not sure if it's the 80-20 rule is that like 80% of running a company is similar, 20% is different, or if it's the other way around. And that's kind of interesting. That's important. Yeah. <laughs> it could go either. I don't know yeah, the answer. I don't either. And so that's slightly problematic, I guess. Um, but let's talk about how you're helping with laying down the tracks on the tax side, like what led you to finding your next thing? Yeah. So the only idea I'd had during that five year post exit period that I couldn't shake was this 
It's I now know it's called retail site selection concept. Okay. Which is kind of next big sound applied to cities and complex adaptive systems like cities, which yeah. is I want to open a bar, restaurant, yoga studio, H and M location. Where's the optimal place to put it? Okay. And how can we use data on every retail location in the country or the world, plus online and offline mobility and census data to inform those decisions and be much smarter about what we build and where we build things? Yeah. And if you're a landlord, should you put a recording studio next to the cement mixer uh, shop or should you put, you know, an industrial... These details matter, you know, like... <laughs> For instance, and how can we be how can we be smarter about that? There has to be a better way, guys. <laughs> and and what other parcels look like this one? And right. the landlord was deciding, you know, the optimal best use of this location, <laughs> highest and best use. Well, I do know that if there is a CVS, there needs to be a Walgreens next to it, and if there's a mattress firm, there has to be another mattress firm next to it. Exactly. Well, I... <laughs> so, I'm taking my year off. I don't meet with a single person for five months. Yeah, it was COVID, so that was really easy. I'm exercising. I'm burning down my to read, to watch, to listen to list. Okay. Down to zero. Yeah. Hitting boredom end of every list. Boredom's healthy. And um, and then starting to ask the like hard questions. And five months in, and then I also kind of layer back in, all right, I want to read every day. I want to eat healthy. I want to exercise. Yeah. I want to play with my kids. I want to see my wife. I want to do all these things. And now I still have eight hours a day that I'm like, want to work on hard problems with smart people. Yeah. And that hit me five, it took me five months. I don't know what the, I would also want to know what the average length of time is for. I feel like I can maybe do a survey and send it out to a group. Yeah. That might be kind of fun actually. So five months for me. And then I'm like, I never want to retire. I just want to work on hard problems with smart people. And then I started looking at like asking every smart person I knew, what are the big thorny hard problems related to real estate cities? Data, fintech, small, medium-sized business owners. Yeah. And chase down the retail site selection idea with uh, Warby Parker real estate team. We're like, how do you open your next store? Walk me through that process end to end. Right, yeah. And would it be helpful if you had a database, blah, 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 blah. Are you thinking about outsourcing the whole process? Because like, so I don't know. This is like one of those things where you're not sure what positions are normal, right? Yeah. Like I imagine that they have a location selection professional. I don't know what education that person goes through. I don't know what platform they have access to, right? But I imagine that they're, they're, that's a job, right? Well, I didn't even know the practice area was called site selection. Yeah. So there is a real estate team responsible for opening new store locations. Right. Orby Parker would be like the perfect example customer because they have all the online proprietary data. That needs okay. to be mixed with offline data around what stores are successful and what are leading indicators of those successes and demographic information, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So um, got put in touch with them and they were like, knowing that we should open a store in or around Grand Central is helpful, but the rest of the process is we need to actually know what leases are available. We need to negotiate with the land. Oh, interesting. We need to do the design, construction, and build out. Wait, are you helping through all those? Like and I was like, I can't build software to do any of that stuff after the the first tell you like you should open in Grand Central. Yeah, that's a lot. So I lost faith that I could build a big scalable software business in the world of site selection. Okay. But through that process tripped over the fact that, wow, there's public information that if you open in Manhattan versus Brooklyn versus Long Island versus Westchester County versus New Jersey, there's all different tax regimes. There's economic incentives, tax credits, local, county, state, federal programs. They're all publicly available, which I was used to. They're just a mess. And they're terrible at marketing. Like you have no idea that these right. things exist. Well-intentioned legislation is passed. It goes onto a municipal website somewhere. To die. Different format than the neighboring county. Yeah. There's no marketing budget behind it. It's a different application form for every single one of them. Okay. And so we had the stupidly ambitious idea to digitize every local, state, and federal program in the U.S. We think there's about three to 5,000. How hard is that to do? Uh, well, we're three years in and we're uh, <laughs> into the startup. This is funny. I, uh, it's like one of those things where like the one of the traps of entrepreneurship is you're like, 
this should be pretty easy. How hard can it be? Like they're publicly accessible. You can like, uh, you can access, you yeah. can run a scraper, you can like outsource a, uh, a team, you pull the data, which is a blessing, right? You want to underestimate it or else you wouldn't do it in the first right. place. And so like you're three years in. Yeah. There's a frightening amount of complexity yes. to, <laughs> to all of this. There's good reasons why the whole world is set up the way that it currently is. I'm more convinced that the business opportunity to bring technology to the world of incentives and tax credits is bigger than I even imagined when we started the company. Figuring out what the right way is to finance that and how to grow it most successfully. How much financing do you need from like a tech standpoint? Because have you finished the scraping over the past three years? We built the, scraping. We built the database of incentive. We built a matching algorithm to pair companies with the programs they should consider. Okay. And then we've built a abstracted application engine, almost like a common app that can take common data points about a company, previous year tax return documents, okay. EIN numbers, revenue, employee counts, and pre-populate PDFs and other applications. Have you gotten to the point where you're proactively sending it out to them? Like sending it out to companies saying you're in this area or you're thinking about this area? Well, here's the problem is that when you approach a company directly with this message, we thought that that would be a no-brainer you're I would think so. On the table. Turns out that everyone thinks their CPA who files their corporate income taxes is on top of all of it. I have very little faith that they're on top of it and that they're looking at these things. Well, you would be correct. Yes. But the problem is that- Does it make more sense to work through the CBAs? I wish you'd uh, said that to me three years ago. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, we're on the podcast. Yeah. Okay. Um, the way that every other specialty tax firm has been built over the last- few decades is fostering a network of thousands of CPAs across the country yeah. that slow drip them clients over time. Okay. Say, hey, I have a potential prospect for the R&D tax credit or a green building incentive. Or, right. Uh, when they build their list. Yep. Okay. And then they f do the fulfillment and they share a re referral fee back to the CPA. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Have you reached out to like Baker Tilly or the bigger? bigger? All we published a book in January, Government Incentives and Tax Credits. That's a good read. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> it probably is a great read. So if you're, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, it's a great <laughs> great sleep aid. Um, but it was primarily a, a way to reach out three times to all the top tax and incentive firms to say, we're publishing this. It's geared towards CPAs. Do you want to be involved? It's a very cool strategy. Did the book work? Did it help push people across the finish line? Yes. The um, CEO of the largest specialty tax firm wrote the foreword to the book. Okay. So that helped us kind of build a relationship. Is this because you wrote a book yourself prior or wrote the blog articles that you were more comfortable with the thought of publishing a book? Because that's, that's not a normal strategy for marketing for entrepreneurs. Yes. Yeah. Running a book on topic, then enter the market. I'm a, one of our co-founders had written the first version of the book in 2019 okay. on his own. That was geared directly to the small business owner. Okay. This one was geared towards CPAs, accountants, bookkeepers, fractional CFOs, the finance teams around these SMBs. That makes sense. How you have to enter into the relationship there. And so that kind of um, demystified it a little bit with having kind of the manuscript and what it was take to self-publish a book. Yeah. And also someone, if I'm not learning every single day, I feel like I'm dying and going backwards. and so. Even going through the process of publishing on Kindle and Barnes and Noble, formatting covers and doing that was was fascinating to me. We probably don't have time to get into this chapter of the Next Big Sound journey, but we actually launched Next Big Book, doing the same thing for book publishers that we were doing for the music industry. Oh, that's fun. So Macmillan was our anchor customer. HarperCollins was our pilot user. I'm sorry, is this a side project? It was a very important revenue source for Next Big Sound. Okay. And easy to fork our Next Big Sound tools for the book publishing industry. What year did this happen? I'm trying to fit it. 14. Okay. So it's free acquisition. Okay. Got you. You wound down next big book through the Pandora acquisition, but I got to meet the CEOs of all the big publishing companies and their teams. That's a good connection. So I knew enough about publishing, but I'd never, there's a huge difference like in all things between knowing the book publishing process and like actually formatting a manuscript. But how much fun is that? Like, I also enjoy, like, with this podcast, I don't know anything about audio, audio. engineering yeah. or editing or uh, YouTube. I don't, I have no idea about YouTube. None. This is going to be on YouTube. Like, I had to learn about, like, this is how you customize a channel. This is, like, the latest, like, uh, way to configure your shorts so that way it leads to your long form. But how, like, 
fascinating is that that you're getting like a crash course in something that great. I have no idea about. So yes, we've talked to all the tax firms and um, like you might expect, they're huge operations. They're wildly profitable. Mm-hmm. They have credits and incentive teams mm-hmm. and probably nine out of 10 of those experts you talk to are like, this is what we do. We're the experts. And we they just kind of kick us in the teeth about like technology can't help you. I think you're in the right space then. Too complex. And then every now and again, we have one of those wonderful conversations where they're a partner at a huge firm that like, is like, wow, you're building a billion dollar business here. This is the total future. And um, I'm so excited and I want to be involved somehow. So have you raised a round of investment for this one yet? Yes. You have. Um, what are the details of the raise? We raised a $3 million seed round in 2021. Okay. Homebrew and Box Group are the two biggest investors, and they've been wonderful. Okay. And I basically got to pick how much we raised and from whom, because it was 2021 and I was a second-time founder. It definitely helps being a second-time founder. Yeah. Um, for sure. And then, like, also, Alex, with, like, your personality and, like, how concise you are, right? Like, I, um, like, spasm and I make a, like, landing page, right? You're very concise. And, like, uh, and also with this type of pivot, you were focusing on data, like, and that sale to Pandora. And then this pivot it seems like a very specific, very, like, there's very clear intention, right? And it inspires a little bit more optimism than that. I felt a lot of <clears throat> pressure in the year off. And for my next thing from any investor I talked to, which was like basically mapping my experience onto whatever was trendy and buzzy then. So it was like, why don't you start an NFT analytics company? And I was like, because I'm not intrinsically fired up about that business. And thank goodness I didn't because it's a long, hard journey. And um, yeah, we're crazy. fired up about tax credits. I, I think it's just as interesting and fascinating as data in the music industry. I think you're 100% right. Yeah. But you had to go a few layers deeper to get that interest. You know what I mean? Like on the surface level? Not. Not at all. Yeah. yeah. My wife looks at me because, um, you know, we've been together a long time and, you know, I was like, Flying to the Grammys and meet them red carpets and meeting all these <laughs> artists and it's so different uh, album listening parties. Um, just like, can you go back <laughs> and just, you know go running around to all the labels? Yeah. And now I'm like, I've got a big meeting at KPMG, and then I'm going over to Baker Tilly, and then I'm going over here and there. Yeah, and, yeah. And I'm like fired up. I'm like, I'm meeting the head of U.S. head of credits and incentives for a big firm. That's awesome. <laughs> wow. <laughs> She's like, I love that for you. I love this journey for you. This is fantastic. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, one of the companies was a dog genetics company. So much cuter, right? Like you're working with puppies. You're working with the puppy bowl as an advertising channel. Like you're on Good Morning America. And then from that to outdoor Yeah. Not sexy. Not cool. You know? And you're like telling people about like you can work, but with people all around the world. And then they're like, like yeah, that's not, not the puppy bowl. I also, for me, was like, I'm going to sign up for, like, I want this to be my next chapter, which is, like, I wouldn't have written the book if I didn't, like, really want to be in the credits and incentive space for a long time to come. Yeah. There's way too much work. And I'm like, even if subsidy doesn't work out, I would I would work in the same space for trying to bring technology and streamline. I just see such a huge opportunity. I'm fired up by the work we get to do when we can connect a well-intentioned program with a business that's doing the right thing that yeah. doesn't know about the program. It's like this win, 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 win for everybody, for the environment, for the community, for the yeah. workers they're hiring, for the business owner uh, to reinvest. And all these programs are triggered based on hiring, buying equipment, investing in your community, rehabilitating right. old historic structures or whatever. And Right, uh, for sure. There's a park down the street from where I live and they got revitalized by one of the bills at best and you would have no idea. Like if, Amazing. Yeah, and if anything, it needs better marketing. So like people need to know about how some of these programs are impacting them. Yeah. So now I walk down the street and I'm like, I wonder if this cement mixing establishment is taking advantage of X, Y, Z incentives and tax credits. We can go next door and find out. And they might be in an opportunity zone or some geographic based program. Opportunity zones are insane. They might be hiring veterans or ex felons. They might be, um, you know, investing in training and upskilling their workers. And uh, there's programs for all of that. People need to know. Where should people go to find you? And then also, do you have like some words of advice kind of tied specifically to like the spaces that you're in slash exit from should people where should people go for tax credits where should people go how should they use some of the information that you're giving them i think on that question if you're running a business 
talk to your CPA very openly and say, are you looking out for local, state, and federal economic incentives and tax credits? And if they say yes, but they're in the 9 and 10, that's, well, probably not. They will all come clean and tell you if you ask them point blank, in my experience. Yeah. Um, But, you know, it never hurts to run a quick Google search around county economic development, state economic development. Uh, I wouldn't even know what to search. So it's good that you're actually saying what to search. Yeah. I wouldn't even know. So use your state, your city, your county, and then federal economic incentive. This is important. What are the most common economic um, like uh, things that people should be aware about? Um, and I, I use a super broad term of things. But um, like if I was to list five things, that, like oppor- you should look up opportunity zones, you should look up uh, research and development credits, like what would be that top list that like they should search? For this audience, your audience, if it's primarily startups and early stage companies, they're usually pretty middle. Like they're, they've, they're hitting the scaling kind of point. We think about the atomic units of incentives and tax credits as a person, a project, or a place. So is your address physical address in a designated community. Mm-hmm. So that could be an energy community if there's been a coal mine closure in your vicinity. Okay. Or an opportunity zone like you've talked about. Yeah. Um, or a new markets tax credit. You would kind of need to plug it into a bunch of just place-based incentives or what those are called. Okay. Um, on a project basis, if you are installing um, a solar system or any kind of energy efficiency project in your lease or owned facility. There's um, incentives related to that. And then hiring, especially if you're hiring from folks that have faced barriers to employment in the past, like ex-military, ex-felons, long-term SNAP recipients. What would this be called for the hiring program? That's called the work opportunity tax credit. Okay. Um, And then R&D is a great one if you're doing anything around innovation. That's a big deal. Um, I know that we took advantage of some of these, but not all, and right. probably a portion of a portion of what we could take a part in. So I missed them all with Next Big Sound. We did zero. Of yeah, them. because you're focusing on running a business. It's right. so hard. If you were to call this podcast, and if you were to give it a title, what would you call it? This episode or the yeah, podcast? Yeah, this title. Would it be like, tax incentives are sexy? Uh, would it be like, from music to taxes? Glamour and glitz across the music industry and tax incentives. Okay, cool. (laughs) Might be too many. We're going. White.com. That's fantastic. Thanks for being on the pod. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. Good to have you. Bye, guys. That's the pod. That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter.